Hey, this is Ricky Potts from the Google Plus Golf community back for another edition of the Friday Foursome. This foursome is going to be awesome because I actually have had the chance to meet the person we're featuring today. Met him earlier this year at the PGA Merchandise Show in Orlando. Don Trahan, Trahan, um, I don't even know your name. Don Trahan from the uh, Don Trahan Golf Academy, and he's also the swing surgeon. And we're going to talk about both the academy, his brand is the swing surgeon. We're going to talk about his son a little bit, but I'm going to stop talking. Let him talk for a couple of minutes and introduce himself. So, Don, feel free to tell us a little bit more about what you do and tell us uh, what, what you got going on right now. All right. Appreciate you having me, Ricky, and uh, the other two gentlemen with us, uh, Les, Les and uh, Jason. And uh, hopefully we can bring some really good, valuable information to all, your, all the golfers out there listening and to the golf world that you all connect to. Uh, briefly, I guess we could say is I'm a PGA Master Professional. I've been a professional for 40 years now, PGA member for 36 years, 40 years starting when I turned pro. And in that time, starting about the mid-80s, I started doing a lot of studying about the golf swing. And basically it was to get rid of a pain in my lower back and my lower right hip. And it never went away except December, January, and February. And that's when I wasn't playing very much golf. And so when uh, I started playing again, it came back. So I knew it was golf-oriented. So starting about the... 83, 84, I really started doing a lot of research into the golf swing, studying the physics and the physiology of it. And I took golf to, and since I'm not a physicist or an engineer and I'm, and I'm not a medical doctor or whatever, I had originally went to college and graduated with a, a double major in history and political science to go and be a lawyer. I'm not scientifically uh, inclined in that regard. So I went to experts to try to find out what was going on. And ironically, the first expert that came actually came to me and his name was Dr. Ned Armstrong. He's an orthopedic surgeon, sports medicine specialist in Alpharetta, Georgia, which is a uh, northwest going from Atlanta up towards Greenville, Spartanburg, which is where I live. And Doc actually called me because I had published a book in around 83, 84, my first book, Golf Plain and Simple. And I talked a lot about that I felt that physiology played an important part in that we should try to swing a club, which seems in a way set up and swing that's natural to the body. And I had a few subtle ideas at that point in time. And I also introduced physics that I thought some of the things were important like centrifugal force and acceleration, momentum, and gravity. So he called me up and said that he was actually astonished that he finally found a golf pro who thought that, that the body played an integral part of swinging a golf club and could he come and talk with me. I said, absolutely. I'd just love to speak with you. So ironically, at that time, I was on the west side of Atlanta, which was off of 75. So by the way, the bird flies, we were probably 20 minutes, 30 minutes apart. But if you had to go down and around from 75 to the loop and then up and the traffic was bad, you know, it might take two days. So... uh <laughs> <laughs> we met on a we, we met on a Saturday uh, Saturday afternoon. He drove up to my club, and I spent the whole afternoon with him. And we've been together ever since. So Doc and I are probably getting close to celebrating a 30th anniversary. So my inquiry into the swing, from the physiological standpoint, started with Doc. A few years after that, in the late about 88 or 80, 87 or 88, I moved to Hilton Head, South Carolina, and took the job as director of instruction for Sea Pines Resort, and I, and I was working out of Harbor Town, and I met a mathematician, engineer, uh, all-around bona fide genius type guy. His name is Henry Rifle, and unfortunately, Henry died late last year, but I spent about 20, over 20 years with Henry teaching me the physics and all the things that belonged in swinging a club, and Henry in his heyday was about a low, low two or three handicap, and, and he had actually had a swing very contradictory. I swung. He was very long and over the top like Henry. Like uh, uh, Henry swung a lot like John Daly. And, and so when I introduced the three-quarter swing to him, he was skeptical because he played very similar that day. And I gave him my five reasons why parallel was a lie, or at least not the optimum way to swing. And I, I taught him, talked to him about that one day. And uh, he said, uh, let me go home and think about it, and I'll call you tomorrow. And he called me that night and said, I'll meet you for breakfast. And he walked into my office and said, you're right, three quarters is better. And so to me, that was almost as good as God sitting there and telling me that I was, that that was correct. So I've amassed a, a team of experts, so to speak, I call, uh, I, that, that I go to when I need things. Over the years, I've I got two more orthopedic surgeons I, I talk with now and then. I've, got, I've run into a couple physicists and other engineers and students, and I got a bunch of these guys on, in my phone on speed dial. I got them, I, 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 I got them on my email address to, call them, uh, to email them. So every now and then when things pop into my head that either a student asks me or I'm thinking about something and I need the experts, I just pick up the phone and call them. All right, or I send them an email and say, we got to talk. So I'm continually searching. 
over the years I've done two biomechanical studies. One was used for a master's thesis at Cal State Fullerton and uh, and it was titled The Effect of a Shortening of the Full Golf Backswing on Clubhead Velocity at Ball Impact. We took overswingers, people who came to parallel, they had to be parallel or longer with a 7 iron, we shortened them up and we the measurement was did they, what happened to their club, sets, club head speed. And uh, most people, if you ask anybody and say, if you take a parallel swing and shorten, what's going to happen to your club head speed? Everybody's going to tell you you lose it. You're going to lose club head speed, but we proved you don't. It stays the same or increase, and even if they were the same, the long swing was in negative acceleration and impact, and the short swing was in positive acceleration, which means the, the way to hit a golf ball, as determined by uh, in a book, The Search for the Perfect Golf Swing by Dr. Alistair Cochran, he said the ball, the club has to be approaching the ball on the aiming line, strike it on the lane and be square, leave on the line, accelerating. And David Pell said the same thing about putting. It has to be on, 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 accelerating. And so we got, we got the first definition and, 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 and statistical hardcore scientific data that shows that, that three-quarter limited turn swing is accelerating through impact, not the same and not and certainly not slowing down as the as the long swings and the big rotational swings are. So we got some solid data. I got another one that was done that that brought in stresses. <coughs> Both of those studies are right now with a, a gentleman who is uh, who's uh, got a PhD in biomechanics and and mechanical engineering, and he's the head of a department of of biomechanical uh, studies in at a major university. And he's taking both of those and going through them and reevaluating them and trying to put some more, uh, shall we say, validation to them. Especially when he's one of the most famous in the world. I'm not going to name any names yet. I just hopefully he'll get done with this and we'll be able to have this up on the sites for everybody to see it. But I got hardcore data. I am the first professional. And I believe in the world that's taken the physics of the ball and club, the physiology of the human body, and married them together to find out exactly what happens to the golf ball. And I basically say this is the way God created the world to turn and the way humans have to play golf to maximize the physics and the way our body swings to maximize the physics. A little more well, than three minutes, me. but... <laughs> Okay. I don't swing all the way to parallel just because I'm lazy and I want to see where the ball's going to go. So maybe have maybe have perfected your swing before I even taking well, a lesson from you. It's amazing how many people that come to me for swings and they say they're three quarters. They're real, and I say, well, why'd you go three quarters? And everybody tells you to make a big turn and go to parallel. They say because the only place I can keep the ball in play is three quarters. So in the event these guys have settled what they in their mind they've settled for less distance. They think it's less distance, but in the end they're not. Because anytime you hit the ball consistently more straight, you got more you got more I guess you could say subconscious confidence to be able to go and swing at it. When you when you when you can hit a ball anywhere, who knows, off the planet right, off the planet left, top it, chop it, or whatever you're not going to ever really let the ball go. You're never going to swing with, with confidence and go ahead and, and, and fit it with what could be anywhere near good power level for you. You're just going to hold on and try to steer it down the middle. So that's the irony. Most people who are three-quarters ended up there because they just decided they like hitting the ball down the middle of the fairway. <laughs> and that never hurts. Like Jason. No. Jason raises his hand there. Jason, do you have a three-quarter swing? I've not seen you swing before. So it's it's funny that you mentioned that because like as you warm up you're not really putting your full you know energy or turn or anything like that into the golf shot but it's amazing how good you hit the first oh I don't know ten shots until you kind of get loosened up or whatever and then as you get more and more loose you kind of oh okay well now I can swing it harder and I can swing it faster and then all of a sudden the ball starts spraying you're hitting it short you're hitting it wide you, you know like all of those things so if you can just maintain like you said the three quarter swing which like you know through my and I'm by no means scientific, but more just trial and error, I've kind of figured the same thing. So I didn't realize that there was a whole theory behind it, such as yours, but it's interesting, and, and I am a believer for that exact reason. Well, it's again, coming back to how many guys have I taught that, that I've said, okay, if when you show, first show up at the golf course, how, when do you play your best golf? In the beginning of the round, the middle of the round, the end of the round? And a lot of guys will say, in the beginning. I said, do you have any reason why it's always in the beginning? I said, it's, I think it's because he says, um, I always feel like I'm a little tight, especially if I haven't gotten there in time to go to the range. And so uh, I'm tighter and I'm really not going after it. I'm not get, I don't have the big turn and the long swing going. And then when I finally get loose and, and get loosened up and I can go at it, and it goes everywhere. I said, well, do you want to keep a swing that, that, that stays under control? It's like anything else. I mean, hey, it's great. You can have a car with 500 horsepower, but you, if you step on the gas a little bit too hard, who knows where you're going to end up and what ditch or up, up, up what 
telephone pole or tree, right? Everything has to stay within control. You can't be full bore, full out on everything. But yet, I can pretty much stand here and swing 90% plus every swing and keep it in play because my swing is under control because it's, it's a three-quarter limited turn swing. We turn only to the forward arm over the toe line. So I'm a right-hander. It's my left arm gets over the toe line. The club goes straight up in the air. Goes, well, goes straight up, comes straight down, and go, it's much easier to go straight up on the other side. It's the same thing as like skipping a rock on a lake. And so a lot of times in lessons, I ask this question, guys, and let's see. We got, we got three really smart golfers over here. There's only one sport in the world that doesn't turn it back to the target. You know what sport that is? I, I guess golf. Bowling. Thank you. I mean, <laughs> well, bowling, yeah. <laughs> one that you're swinging, swinging club. Yeah, bowling might be it. And what yeah, is it? Ball. What do you do? What does a bowler do with a bowling ball? Straight back, straight through, right? Just like, just like, just like uh, NCAA. Go watch these girls playing softball. The pitchers, just straight up and down, all right. But in, as far as the hitting sport, golf's the only one in the world that doesn't turn it back to the target. Now, the other side of the coin, there's only one sport in the world that hits or throws anything that doesn't teach you to to when you hit it to follow through and finish and stay square to your target when you finish. You know what sport that is? Golf. That's what it, yeah. Golf, exactly. <laughs> they now want you turning. They now want you taking a big, huge turn. You're back to the target in the backswing. Your arms get way behind your body back here. And then they want you to turn and swing all the way through to get your right shoulder at the target. So your chest is over there, 50, 60, 70, 100 yards to the left. You're wrapping your arms around your body, right? How many people have you seen like this? They're to the top hand, it's to the ground like this. I'm finishing like this right here, square to my target. And like I, like I said on my very first video, when I asked questions and we answered them, I said, did God give golfers a dispensation to play by their own set of rules? I don't think so. The rules of physics, physiology, and, and our arms swing only one place in front of our body. And the second your arms start going around your body, they start breaking down. It starts causing a lot of tension. And when it breaks down, the arms rotate. The club goes flat and laid off. So a club is, is back over there someplace. Instead, I'm, my club is straight up in the air like this, straight up and down. I let go of my club. It falls straight down my hands. You go look at 98% of the guys on the tour, the club's over there. They let go of the club, it falls behind them. So I come back and I say to somebody, using this pen as a club, if I, which club am I going to hold up long, longer? If I'm holding a club like this, with all that weight back there, or I'm holding it this way? It's that way, gravity. It's in, it's, it's right, it's in harmony with gravity. If it drops, it drops straight down. If I, if I hold my club over here, it drops down there. All right, so, so we're playing. You want gravity to be your number one friend. Gravity is the number one law in the universe, and all the other laws revolve around and are, and are subject to gravity. Everything in the world is subject to gravity. So you want your club going straight up in the air, straight down, and that's the only way you can swing your arms in front of your body. So God called, made gravity, and he, and he designed our arms to swing <laughs> up and down. So when we stand behind the ball, you swing up and down. You stand closer to the ball, you hit, and, you, and you fire it, hit it dead solid straight right down the middle. If well, you I'm playing golf tomorrow morning, and I, I'm, if I if I put these swing thoughts in my head, I'd better be on the range because I don't want to end up shooting 85 oh, tomorrow because I'm thinking about which way my arms are swinging. Well, the first thing <laughs> first thing you do is go to range and tie it up. It's just take it straight back in. I got a I got a I got a, a visualization a visualization that I use to teach people. If you imagine on your aiming line, if you put a club down and hit your aiming line, and you and you and you dress it, just inside the aiming line will be a catcher and with a catcher's mitt. You start to you take your swing and put it in the catcher's mitt, toe up. So you're going to let your arms rotate a little bit. See, your arms rotate back and forth like this. And then once you're in the catcher's mitt, there's a tree right behind you. You lift your arms straight up the tree. They drop straight down, hit the ball. You go into the forward catcher's mitt. There's a, that same line on the other side. There's a forward catcher's mitt, and you go up the tree on that side. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. In the mitt and up the tree. That's the first thing I was ever known for. I dreamed that one up. 1982 or 83 when I had uh, one of those little – tips that, they, that you put in Golf Digest. It was the only thing I ever did for Golf Digest because a few years later I ended up becoming a golf magazine teaching editor. I was on their masthead. I was between Bob Toskey and Dr. Gary Wyron up there with all the other big teachers in there. I mean Toskey, Flick, and everything else between Toskey and Gary Wyron. And, and so after that, everything I had done was, was with Golf, Di golf Magazine and I made the top 50 best teachers list, the first one I ever had in the top 100. And so I've been, I've been a golf magazine guy most of my life. But the first thing I ever wrote was in the mitten up the tree. I just like, I like to create visual images when I do my golf lessons and I, I do a written analysis of everybody. Because being a swing surgeon, they call me surge for short. I, I, I got a written analysis I do. I've been doing them since 1983 around there. And I had a guy show up about a month ago for a lesson with one from 1986. 
he had a sheet from 1986. So he was he was very likely a member or took a lesson from me when I was at Punchy Country Club in Kennesaw, Georgia, which is north of Marietta, Georgia, or as they say it, Marietta. And that's where I, as I said I met Dr. Armstrong. So I've been doing this for a long time, and I write it up. I write all the things I see in your setup, then I write down what I see in your swing, and the first thing we do is I do your, that's what I call the diagnosis. The first part of your prescription is my motto is the setup determines the motion, so if anything's wrong, we've got to fix the setup. If there's anything wrong with your swing, we've got to fix that first because that determines your swing. I write that out in what I call pre-swing thoughts. Then I give you an in-swing thought. All my in-swing thoughts are based on creating visualizations and pictures. The, most people, the mind works great in pictures. Just put a picture in your mind, catches mitten up the tree, catches mitten up the tree. That's the one I'm most famous for. People always know. Uh, it's amazing how many people have heard, at least heard of that. No kidding. Well, I, Les, who is Mr. Power Blogger himself, if you haven't gotten about ten topics for blog posts, we'll listen to him talk for five minutes. Oh, my goodness. Are you going to go out and practice this in the mitt and up the tree stuff? Well, at my age, i got to practice something, you know, because, because you're, you're, uh, I'm sure the physiology of, of, of age makes you go three-quarter swing, doesn't it, uh, Don? Well, not really. You've got some people that are really supple, but the key is is that this is considered the body-friendly golf swing. And right now, I will honestly say this. If, if, if you blog, if you, if you go and Google anything that says or, or Bing it, whatever it is that you use, you <laughs> probably shouldn't have sent Big, huh? Yeah. No, you can this say whatever good. you want. You're so, good. Uh, and, you, and, and right now, many, many other golf instruction websites out there are jumping on saying that they're body-friendly because they've seen the success I've had. I mean, swingsurgeon.com is my main site, and as, as, as Ricky was saying, I got different, I got different uh, brands or whatever. My, my original brand is this logo right here, my Swing Surgeon logo. You probably can't see it. It's a medical caduceus with a golf ball on top, and that's the name of the website. My other major brand is my double P's, all right, if you can see it here, and it's, yeah. it's, it's peak performance, and we call it the peak performance golf swing, or sometimes people call it the surge swing. So you can find me in those relationships. But the key is it's a body-friendly swing. As I said, many other ones aren't. I mean, when they – number one key, doc, first thing Dr. Armstrong ever told me, a wide stance is the number one killer to a bad back. So you, you play with anybody who wants a stance wider than your shoulders, especially really wide like some teachers, some swings teach, you're, in, it's gonna be, you're gonna be just running for back problems. So we are the body-friendly swing. So swingsurgeon.com is the main site. We are in – we have people in 128 countries that, that are signed up on our site, and they actually at one time called them, they, they nicknamed themselves Surgites. They nicknamed our community the Surge Nation, <laughs> and they gave themselves a motto, the sun never sets on a Surge Nation, all right? And when people learn this swing, 90% of them probably came here because of bad back issues or any other physical issue. And when they learn this swing, the pain, for the most part, the pain goes away almost completely, if not tremendously away. I've had people scheduled for back surgery, find this swing. They weren't even supposed to putt. And they go out and they say, this swing makes sense. That's the one thing everybody says. When you go to swingsurgeon.com and start reading it, you could go there and sign in at the top. You'll see name, put your email address in, your name, and then your email address. And you'll immediately receive one of the 10 major mistakes amateurs make. And in each one of those mistakes, I'm going to prove to you how basic, 100% people think gospel things to do to playing golf. I will show you. I will prove to you. In the scientific world, they never like the word prove. They like to use the word show. That I will show you that one of the reasons why you have all these problems from hurting elbows, hurting backs or whatever, and don't hit the ball very good is because you're not playing by the rules. You're not playing by the laws of physics and, the, and your physiology. And I, keep, I prove a number of them to them. One of them is don't keep your head down. People want you to keep your head down as long as you can keep it. That's a bad one. Another one, uh, it's just, you know, hit down on the ball. That's another major one. We do not hit down on the ball. We swing from the top of our backswing up to the finish. I want you coming through and, and clipping the ball off the grass, tearing the grass out of the ground. Don't want you hitting down. And, I, and, and you, when you see that video, it's, I'm going to give you two, three, four, five causes and effects of why you don't do it that way and do the way we teach in, in, a, in a peak performance golf swing. And so you get those ten major mistakes and you start getting my dailies uh, lessons that come out normally every day if we don't get caught up with things to do and don't get behind schedule and and I shoot those dailies in my backyard I got a net I got a mat and everything else and and I shoot them in there and basically they're usually questions that come in the blog into blogs or they come in through our customer service where people on a that have registered on the site they 
studying the swings or whatever. They ask a question, I answer them in the dailies. And, and those go very well. And I think I can honestly say I probably got the most famous backyard in the world, except for that guy on TV. <laughs> Remember, he had to talk to the guy over the fence. Yeah, that from uh, Tool Time or whatever. Tool Time or whatever it was. I think after yeah. him, I might have the most famous backyard in the world. Because it's awesome. all over the world. <laughs> well, i tell you what. Um, uh, I'm blown away with the amount of information that you've been able to just get out there. And you've got me wanting to just go spend a few hours on the website. But uh, one of the things that I wanted to talk about, um, past yourself, is your son. Uh, your son, DJ, is actually a PGA Tour winner. Uh, tell me a little bit more about him and what you do with him. And does he follow your, your methods or does he have his own swing coach? Oh, no, I've, uh, from DJ's basically, I had a golf club in his hand from about the day he can walk. We have a picture of him with a little plastic club about this big, and it's either a baseball bat and a ball or, or a golf club. He played baseball till about 13, and, and by then, uh, we, when, we moved, when I moved to Harbortown, he was about eight years old, and so from eight years old on, he's been seeing tour players and see me teaching tour players and, and top amateurs, both men and women. At one time, I had three ladies on the LPGA tour. So And DJ got to play with most of them because DJ was really, by eight or nine years old, from the tees he was playing, was pretty much already shooting par golf and definitely by 10 years old. And so from the time he was like four or five and I started teaching him, I started teaching him correctly because I had already was into the this, this swing. So he grew up he, he grew up with the three-quarter limited turn swing. So he was always an uh, extraordinarily good ball player, good and a good golfer. Uh, at one time, when he was in college, he was the number one ranked amateur in the world and collegiate player of the year in 2002. And he's the one of the most decorated athletes in the history of Clemson, uh, uh, Clemson University, and was twice Clemson athlete of the year in 2002 and three. That's a golfer beating out football players and basketball players at a at a <laughs> you know ACC team at a, uh, at ACC school. So that was pretty outstanding. He turned pro. He's won twice. So DJ, outside, without a doubt, says I'm the only teacher he's, he's ever had and the only one he will have. And he follows the golf swing. But DJ's been in a little bit of a slump the last two or three years, uh, basically because he never left the swing. He just kind of he, – he, he just wasn't following the rules. I got things I, got things I call five secrets. The reason why they're secrets is they're secrets to you guys because you don't know what they are. But if you go to the website and you start reading into them – and you find out what the five secrets are, they become five rules, right? If you ever watch CSI, when, when Gibbs always says he's got all these rules, if you, don't break a, if you don't break a Gibbs rule, you're in great shape, right? Well, DJ's been bending the rules a little bit in that, in that rule number five states, and I guarantee you, you, every one of you will probably say, yeah, I've done that, and all my buddies do that, right? You hit a bad shot, and what do you say? Man, what did I do wrong, Right? So now, as soon as you said what you did wrong, that's like opening the Encyclopedia Britannica, or that's like the Google search of everything in golf that could have gone wrong. So well, what is it? Is it this or that? And I sometimes say, look at the leaves on a tree. Is it this leaf or that tree? Or is it, is it, it break open this fortune cookie? Yeah, it could be that. Yeah, it might be that one. Yeah, it might be that one. And, and then all you're doing is, is, is just boggling your mind more. So the answer is, is what, you, what you've learned to peak performance golf swing, and you know the first four rules, and all the things that go around them, rule number five says, if you ask yourself what I do wrong, the answer is, who cares? Do the next swing right. Correct. Do the next setup and swing correctly. All right? Now, it boggles my mind when I see advertisements for other golf schools and other pros, and they got a student that says, yeah, the greatest thing about this school was is, is I, learned, I learned about the swing so that I know when I do something wrong, I know what I'm doing wrong. What do I care what I'm doing wrong? Wrong is no good. I want to do it right. Just focus on the right. <laughs> so what DJ got there into, go. he, got, he got into toying around with his swing. And, and in the last couple of years, every now and then when I see him, I look at him and say, DJ, what in the heck are you doing, bro? Well, I'm trying this. I try, DJ, what's rule number five? I mean, it's no different for you as anybody else. It's even worse for you as far as I'm concerned because you, 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 after me, there's nobody in the world that knows more about the swing than you, and you're breaking rule number five. That's the one that's going to keep you on a straight and narrow more than anything. So he's been toying around with that, and then, and then as everybody knows who knows DJ, he's, he's flopped in and out of putting issues, and his putt is probably hurting him hurt him most than anything. But I really think in the last couple of years, it's the frustration of the putter has put more pressure on his, on, his, on his long game, and it's caused him to probably get off on these tangents. But I've kind of I've taken out the whip and, you know, and smacked him in the back of the head and said, hey, get back to basics. 
Who cares what's wrong? You know what to do right. Do it right. Get into the correct setup and make the correct swing. And he's been basically, for the last three or four years, been turning a little too much and swinging too long and getting a parallel, especially with the driver and the three wood and maybe his long irons. And, and he's, he had a great tournament, uh, what was it, last week, I guess, at uh, what was the last tournament he played in? Whatever. Uh, oh, it was uh, Dallas. Uh-huh. Uh, he hit like he hit like eighty two percent greens and eighty seven percent eighty two percent fairways and eighty seven percent greens. He was three in fairways and two in greens, and uh, but he had like two putts per green. So so he just putted himself into uh, into mediocre scores. But he he made the cut and but he hit the ball great. So it's coming around and he and he's and he's and, and when he talks to me he says he says he's definitely got the three quarter limited turn swing back, and he's really holding it. He said his caddy, Todd, has got one job to watch him, and if he gets a little bit long, Todd's – I should have said, I hope Todd's got the permission to hit you in the head with a wedge. But I think he's got at least it, at least he's got the permission to, permission to say, yo, bro, three quarters, man. Well, I don't know. I mean, first off, I feel like if he's if he's two-putting every green, we should hang out because I two-putt at most every green that I get a hold of too. But you're whipping him in the back of the head. His caddy's hitting him with a wedge. I think he might be afraid to not hit the ball straight because he might be getting beat up on the driving range. No, nah, he's, he's hitting it good. I mean, he he. I told him that the best year I ever remember is 2002 when he was collegiate player of the year. I used to show up and, it, and he used to say to me almost – Every time for a whole year, he said, Dad, you've been here for 30 minutes. You've been here for 45 minutes. You haven't said one word. When are you going to say something? All I said was, wow. I said, it's so good. Every swing is like I'm watching a rerun of the first swing. I said, and that's what I started telling him the other day. I said, I said, there's no reason. Basically, you're searching in the wrong place for all the swings. I said, DJ, the swing's in your mind. All you got to do is get back in your mind and find that swing that you had back then which is what you had almost the whole your life till then. It wasn't until about three or four years ago you really started getting carelessly long with uh, too much turn and too long a backswing, which gets you deep. Everything behind your toe lines I call the sacred burial ground. You can stand in it, but if you're swinging it, you're dead. So you get your arms and club get way behind your toe line. Out, it's got to come back out and around. This is the biggest cause of over in the top and outside in. And I just said, you got to get back in your mind, DJ. Go find a swing. It's back in there. But you got to commit to the three quarters. And he's back there, and I mean – you get three quarters. You could just hit bullets all day. That's awesome. I don't miss very many fairways when I I don't ever practice, and I don't miss very many fairways, and I don't miss that many greens. For my whole playing career, I used to average on average no less than fourteen greens around, and and I don't care how tough the golf course was. You just stand there straight back and through, straight back and through, and if you aim, if you even re remotely aim anywhere in the right direction, your ball just goes straight. Sounds pretty easy, right? Golf's not hard. <laughs> it is. It's not that hard. The swing isn't as hard as everybody makes it. It's not easy, but it's not hard, especially if you if you got a simple swing. I just think we got very little body motion. Turn a little bit, lift your arms up, down, and turn and finish square to the target. Man, I wish we had it's more than half an hour swing. to to talk with you because I feel like we could just talk all day about this. But less, I we're running out of time. I got a couple of minutes left. But less, anything else you want to know before we take off? I've got a laundry list of questions that I want to know. But well, we can always. What do you want to know? We can do this again, guys. I got no problem. I love talking about golf. That's my job. That's my living. <laughs> the, the 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 most famous the golfer, golfer that you have uh, taught would would be who? Besides your son. Well, I've I've worked with. Uh, I've worked with uh, – I haven't really ever worked that much with a lot of big tour players, but I, I've worked with uh, Rick DeMarco, who, who is already vertical, uh, 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 and uh, Chris DeMarco, that is. And I actually – years ago, I taught Joe Durant, who actually is the person DJ beat in his, to win his first tournament uh, in 2005, I guess, or whatever it was, which used to be called uh, – which is now the tournament in Mississippi, whatever it's called. It's got a new name every year, and he and he beat Joe Duran. I, I I taught Joe back in the early '90s, and and I've I've given things. I've talked down into a few other top guys, but I haven't worked with a lot of top PGA Tour players. I don't know. Maybe PJ it, doesn't want to give them the secret, you know. I guess it'd be a c kind of difficult to get some of those guys to just go three quarter swing as as far as they wrap it around their head nowadays. Yeah, they would, but I, I've I've said many times on my dailies, and I'll say it right here. I could fix Tiger Woods in 30 minutes or less, and if he takes that long, he's a slow learner. And, Hear that, Ricky? Hear that, Ricky? <laughs> After the way he's playing this week, I think he might need to give you a phone call. 
and the same thing with Phil Mickelson. I'd love to get a hold of Phil. I could, I, I can remember he changed teachers a while back, and the first thing the teacher came, that teacher came and publicly said is, I'm going to get his driver under control by teaching him a three-quarter backswing. Well, he's never been three-quarters since he's been with that guy, and part of it is because a lot of people want to be three-quarters, but they don't know how to teach it. I do, and I've actually had people say, tell me one thing, a Another big-time teacher say, there's no way you could teach somebody three-quarters. Well, I'm sorry. I can do it. I've done it for 20, 30 years. I wouldn't be where I am if I told people I'm going to teach them a three-quarter swing and nobody ever learned it. All right? And, and I, could, I could probably change Phil with one nine-word sentence and, and, and get him hitting, it, hit, hitting the ball as longer and longer and a heck of a lot more straight. And, and I like Phil a lot. I think Phil's a good guy. And, and uh, if he could ever get his driver under control, he'd be in good shape. Same thing with Tiger. And – and if you really want to see Tiger, go Google Tiger Woods U.S. Amateur Championships and look at his three amateurs and look at his swings back there. In fact, somebody sent me an email where they, they, they put a thing up there with about five different Tiger swings and some of his amateurs and everything else. And he is kind of vacillating back there a little bit more in his finish. But the finish they were showing were only short clubs like this, like where he's hitting wedges and stuff in there. He is swinging freely, standing up his wedges in the forward swing. But once he gets the longer clubs, his hands are wrapping way around his body. But... Tiger Woods was a lot closer to what I teach to what the, the peak performance swing or some people call the surge swing back when he was amateur before he turned pro and, and left his original amateur teachers and started dealing with these more famous tour teachers. And they got him going more towards the rotational stuff. And all I know is I could help both of those guys and I probably could de very definitely reduce the stress and give Tiger a lot better chance that he's not going to blow his knee out again. But his knee, his left knee is bad, really bad. That's what my three orthopedics tell me, my orthopedic surgeons tell me. Well, we might have to do this again because we are out of time, but I want to thank Les and Jason for just sitting there and listening. I feel like we didn't get to talk to you guys very much today, but that's, that's okay right. because that's actually right. what we're going to do is we're going to schedule another one of these sometime later this winter just to kind of recap what we've talked about today and to talk more about this and just to continue to learn about this three-quarter swing. But thank you very much for it's taking there. time out today. Um, this Friday foursome as all Friday foursomes is powered by foursome golf. And I am excited. I already see questions coming in on Google plus. I'll make sure this gets posted there. It'll be posted on YouTube and I'll make sure all questions get directed right to you, but you have a good afternoon and we'll okay. get this scheduled Schedule for the next one, one and for we'll three hours soon. Schedule the next one for three hours. <laughs> okay. I might be able to do that. We'll just do it. You and me. <laughs> okay. You guys Thanks take very care. Much, guys. Right. We'll see you on the all golf right. course. All right. Bye -bye. See you.